stubborn ass We can put our heads together and move <laughs> Hey there, everyone. It's Christy here with an episode of An Atheist Asks, a series that I haven't done in a very long time. I've been doing a lot of other hangouts, but not this kind of specific one. I'm really happy today to have Micaiah from Micaiah B's channel here today. And it's most of my episodes of An Atheist Ask to date have been with other atheists. But the reason why I named the show An Atheist Ask, not ask an atheist is because I wanted to talk to other people and ask them questions. So I'm the atheist who's asking. And Micaiah and I have gotten to know each other through YouTube. We've become YouTube friends. And it's been a real joy uh, to get to know him and his perspective on things. And so when someone asked why I hadn't like had Micaiah on and said doing it on an atheist ask, I thought that would be a fantastic idea. Said they were right, and we tried to organize it. We've we've had a couple um, cancellations just because of life, but finally, yes, here in the same Google Hangout, and we're going to talk about his channel. We're going to talk about uh, belief and faith and values, and then we're also going to talk about a shared passion. We both are really interested in the Bible and have studied it and know it, and I, I'm literally looking forward to that part of our conversation. So first, Mick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Right. So let's get started now. I've done a lot of the talking. So the nice thing about my show, as I said off air, is that I get to just ask questions of people that I find interesting and listen to what they have to say. Let's talk a little bit about your YouTube channel and where you started, how it's changed and evolved, what it's been like to be a member of the YouTube community. And basically, like, you know, from like creator to creator, what has been, what was your experience and what has, yeah, like, how has YouTube been for you? Um, well, I started uh, a little over two years ago, it looks like. I'm actually looking at my my videos and everything, but uh, a little over two years ago is when I started. And I had been watching a lot of videos like Steve Shives. I, at the time, was watching Dark Matter 2525. I was, of all people, I watched some of Thunderfoot's Why Do People Laugh at Creationists? Wow, videos. we have very similar. Yeah, that's yeah. totally where I was too. <laughs> and for me, it was, I was wanting to look at um, religion. And so I was going through all these different skeptics channels. And uh, aside from really Steve and um, I think Deconverted Man was another one. And uh, John Smith was the third one. Pretty much everybody was doing these, why do people laugh at X? or they were doing debunking videos, or they were doing response videos, and it just kind of got a little bit old, and the Dark Matter 2525 ones were a lot of things that I had already personally looked at and covered, but were in a humorous light, so I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. And I decided after that to go, well, there's not a whole lot of discussion about translation errors changing the story or transliteration errors or story of oh well lucifer with a lowercase is this well i'm going to add an uppercase because it looks prettier and now all of a sudden it's a proper name uh errors like that changing the whole narrative of a of a book in the bible and so i started planning out what i wanted to do for my videos and i looked back on my notes from when I was in seminary of different things and went, oh, let's just cover some of these topics. They're kind of fun. And I was also at the same time working with a uh, group called Crisis Pregnancy Centers, The Pro-Life Trap. And I had offered to put up videos of stuff that I had researched and found out. And so it was kind of a mix of those. I wanted to focus on religion, but I also wanted to get the other stuff out that I was dealing with. And so I did a little video of what my personal beliefs were. And then I did a video basically of a little experiment that I ran um, using uh, Dark Matter 2525's video is Christianity moral. And so I actually took a chunk of that and I went around and I asked people, 
about if you were able to travel back in time to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, claiming that this is a real event, would you stop the crucifixion knowing that you would no longer have uh, somebody to take the blame? You would have to take full responsibility for every action you ever do from here on out. And it was it was actually kind of funny because I got a lot of a lot of responses and things like that of yes i would save him nobody nobody deserves to die it's not fair uh my religious friends oh this is just the sacrificial lamb in human form all these different things and then i got the creationist answers and i even got of all people ken ham to answer it and it was just wait 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 how did you get ken ham to answer it i posted it on his wall Wow. Saying that I was a theology student and this was a paper I was doing. And it was just the, the mental gymnastics of, well, this was already ordained. And so we can't go back and change it because God would stop us and it has to be done for this. And I'm sitting there going, so you would rather let somebody die so that you have no responsibility. And it was just like. Holy fuck, what is wrong with these people? And um after that I took a took a bit of a break. I was dealing with life issues and then I came back and did a video that was actually a paper I did in seminary where I boiled down all the religions that I had studied into their I took out all of the God stuff, all of the mythos, all of the, the fluff, so to speak. And I boiled it down to its basic components. And every religion that I did that on, it boiled down to basically two points. Be good to yourself and be good to others. And I was, and so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's make a video about it. And I did. And... Thankfully, it had better reception than it did in my class because when I brought that up in, God, I brought it up in a seminary class as well as a psychology class. And the psychology class, this one girl just shot up and was like, no, because that one doesn't have God. I was like, okay, well, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Let me know where I lost you. <laughs> because I said, if you remove the gods. <laughs> yeah. The but, first premise of the thought experiment. <laughs> yeah. And so I actually wrote it out like you would a lab experiment. And I went through and I wound up focusing on the golden rule as my example. And I went through and a couple of them, I was like, okay, this is a bit of a stretch, but it still works. Uh, Satanism was the one that was a bit of a stretch, but it was basically do not harm others unless they harm you and then destroy them is what the tenant slight is. modification yeah slight modification just, just mild yeah um and i was like okay and so i went through all these different ones and it was it was a lot of fun to make and then i just kind of started going with what i was comfortable with and i got into um discussing about mental issues that i had uh things like dealing with the voices in my head, the the mental issues I had. I discussed coming out as transgender, all sorts of stuff. And then I was like, okay, everybody's discussing Christianity or they're discussing paganism. Okay. I'll discuss Scientology. And it wasn't even like the rest of the people of I'm going to do this from a bad angle. I was trying to do it as a, um, a look at it from an outsider with no outside opinions, basically. Because I had friends and family who were former Scientologists who didn't experience all of the horror stories that I've heard other people say. And so I was just trying to figure out, okay, let's let's try and provide another viewpoint. And I I had to stress over and over and over. This is my opinion as somebody who is not, and it's like then they would, these people, and it was never the Scientologists that got angry at me, even when I was critical of it. 
it was the people who wanted more of the hate on Scientology thing. And they started posting my stuff up on boards. They started sending people to make comments at me. And I finally just went, okay, I'm, I'm dropping this series. And I, I had access to the books. I had access to all this sort of stuff. And I was going to discuss how like there was borrowing from psychology. There was borrowing from this religion, borrowing that sort of thing is what I wanted to discuss. But the amount of hate that I got on it, it was like, I, it, it's not worth it. It's not worth my safety, so to speak. And so I dropped that series. And then I just decided to stick with religion until uh, probably about a year ago. I just got it just it felt like I was dragging through the through the mud. Because everything had already been discussed. I was getting like less than a hundred views on these things. People were like, you talk to, you talk to academically. I'm oh, sitting there no. going, wait, I, I, I talk in, do you want me to talk in monosyllable type stuff or should I stick with grunting? Right. Um, but Not everything with, is at a Trump level. Yeah. And it was like, with uh, Deconverted Man, I did a series called Carm Harm, which the, the website, Matt Slick's website, Carm, and we basically yeah, broke sure. down um, his section on sexuality. I took all the stuff involving religion. He took all the stuff uh, involving, like, the logical fallacies and everything. So, um, other than that, I just ran a, a weekly series called Monday Morning Blasphemy, which was just I would get on and randomly talk about whatever happened to pass through my news feed or something religious that was just kind of weird that it was like uh, one guy who claimed that women's periods are proof of Satan because if you look at the ovary and uterus, it looks like the goat horned uh, Baphomet God. <laughs> so it's just like all this weird stuff yeah. that I would discuss. But then just I started noticing that the skeptic community was getting really, really, it was almost like it was consuming itself. Um, I, when I was discussing with Harvey, I likened it to uh, the snake, the, the Ouroboros. It was eating itself because it was like, oh, well, to prove that we are actually skeptics like we claim, we're going to attack our own. Right. And this was about the time that uh, they really started going after Steve. And it was like, oh, we need a whipping boy. Here's this guy talking about compassion and all this other stuff. Let's attack him type thing. And I was kind of going, okay, I want to move back from this. This is getting a little bit creepy. And so I started discussing um, more on reproductive rights and mental health. And then I just really started discussing about social issues and moving away from religion because it was nobody really seemed to care about what I discussed except for my fans who were really into it already. And I was like, okay, you're really into when I discuss about the mythology of Crater Lake or the mythology of the different flood myths. And yet nobody else was watching it. And what they were watching was like the mirrors that I did, or if I did a Monday morning blasphemy that had this really weird title, like bag o dicks was one of them. <laughs> and it was in response to the, uh, the protests that were going on in Eastern Oregon. And I tried doing, I, I, and at the time I was trying to do, uh, like reading this one book, which, Oh God, I wound up, that was the first book that I ever burned. I literally set the thing on fire when what, I was, done. <laughs> which one was it? Cause I felt like that about Karen Armstrong after a history of God. What was yours? Uh, it was me obey him. And it was talking about the uh, needing to 
basically be the proper wife and how she wasn't being a proper wife because she was feeling defiant and you need to submit and all this stuff. And as I'm reading it, yeah, as I'm reading this thing, I'm going, oh my God, this is frightening. It's, it's just what is wrong with this because it's justifying abuse. It's justifying uh, slavery. Yeah. And patriarchy doesn't exist in the West, Nick. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't exist in the religion with books that are coming out like this all the time. No, no. It doesn't oh, exist. Oh, yeah. I've I've got a whole stack of books that I'm like, Steve, give me a P.O. box. I'm going to send these to you because I'm a sadist <laughs> and I want to watch you suffer. <laughs> <laughs> Read these. Do a series on these. Yeah. Um, but also at that time, I had just put out a video basically – trying to hold out an olive branch for going, Hey, I'm a feminist. I want to try and reach across the aisle to the anti-feminist community. There are so many things that we can work on. We need to stop being so petty. And I got some decent responses. I also got some complete bullshit responses and I still do. But for a while I did a series called uh, perspectives every week with the woolly bumblebee and we discuss different stuff. And the, the funny thing with that was that both of us wound up growing from it because there was stuff like in feminism that I wasn't really familiar with. And then there were preconceived notions on her end with feminism and us discussing stuff really started working stuff out and got us both to start reading up and educating ourselves on it. That's great. And we I mean, originally we started out talking about like feminism, MRA, pickup artists, stuff like that. And then we went, let's discuss actual issues. Right. And we noticed that when we were discussing the actual issues like uh, reproductive health, domestic abuse, all these other things that both sides, the non-feminist, the anti-feminist, whatever term you want to use, and the feminist side agreed on almost everything it was just how to go about it that was Mm -hmm. not agreed upon yep and it was it was really eye-opening for me and also for her and a lot of the people who listened but due to health reasons and with her trying to finagle all of her kids and everything and with me dealing with all the crap in my life we just kind of went okay well we'll put this series on hold for a while Mm. so that's where it went Mm-hmm. Okay. And other, I mean, basically, I started after that just really discussing social issues, and I started a a series, <laughs> um, basically looking at things like BDSM and kink culture because there was so much disinformation out there, and I was like. I really need to discuss this because I I've lived in kink culture for most of my adult life. And it was just how little there was that people knew about was like, well, this is why we get people reading 50 shades of abuse over here. And Uh, yeah, I've seen the title. That's about as close as I've come. (laughs) Yeah. The, if anybody who has ever taken a psychology course or a, course in social work that has dealt with the topic of abuse you can pull out that abuse checklist that like all teachers seem to like to give out with the cycle of abuse and all that fun stuff you go through that book and just sit there and you will check off everything in it and it's frightening just how how romanticized the abuse in the stalking and everything it's like no this is this is no bad i ah yeah there's a i mean i know it's to a very uh extreme degree but yeah there's this this old i older idea i think it's it's fading now in hollywood that if a man is interested in a woman he really just needs to pursue her and pers- be persistent and show up and surprise her and give her things and that's somehow going to win her over and now we call that stalking you know so yeah these these ideas of romanticizing power dynamics or behaviors that are actually not conducive to forming healthy relationships is something that it does require critique 
and you know, actually kind of like picking this book up and going, this isn't like erotica. This is messed up. Look at mm-hmm. all the ways this is messed up. So it's great that, you know, you're able to, to do that with a knowledge of a community or, um, you know, a way of life that I, I don't know much about. And maybe a lot of other people too don't have a lot of inter- information. So they get it through the media and the media doesn't necessarily get things right. So yeah, that's a, it's a really good thing that you can check your experience against the, the representation of what sells. Yeah. Cause I, mean, it's like when, God, what was it? Oh, it was the Brock Turner rape case is when it got brought up again, when it came to consent. And I'm sitting here because kink culture and BDSM culture is often called consent culture. And it's because you have to constantly be getting reaffirmation of consent. It's not just, okay, I signed a contract, you get to do whatever type thing. Excuse me. And it was just looking at it going, okay, if I can understand consent and I can teach the topic of consent to my kids using stuff from kink culture without bringing the sex portion into it why is it so hard for mainstream culture to understand it and it was it was something that to this day frustrates me let me ask you a question hmm. oh yeah sorry you finish and then i'll go well it was because i was able to understand it because the main thing with uh with kink because i i got out of the bdsm portion but there's still kink which is a different BDSM's within kink, I guess you could say. And I got, there was just this, it's a constant communication. There's a constant dialogue moving back and forth. And that seems to be lacking when it comes to relationships and all this other stuff. And I discussed it with Harvey, who's a former pickup artist. Um, and there you go. Feminist marrying a pickup artist. <laughs> um, but even he said that with him, it was upfront, honest, even if to the point of bluntness, and you verified consent constantly. And if you're not doing that, you're no better than a rapist. And it was like, how, how is it that we can understand this and these people can't? The question that I wanted to ask you was if you were, if someone was, let's say, presented you with a hypothetical situation that they um, were out with someone they were hitting it off really well and the person um, who was interested in or practiced kink culture, I don't know the right way to talk about this, Mm -hmm. if that's close, um, offered that to the other person. And that person was either, you know, uh, um, noticeably drunk or high would, and the person they were trying to get them to come back and do something for the first time. Would you say that, um, it would be a wise choice to get somebody who was impaired by alcohol or drugs in that sort of situation. Um, or would you tell them that it would be hard to understand where they were consenting in that situation and they better better not do that that while while that person's drunk or say hi? Um, well, the main thing is that if it's like a first time meetup or a first few times meetup and you're still really establishing understanding, you do not want to do it when alcohol is involved. You establish all this stuff while the person is fully sober. Um, and I, I know some people argue, well, I get drunk and my wife and I have sex. Does that mean that we can't consent and that she's raping me? It's, it's, it's different because you've established consent over time versus this is a first time introducing it. You want the person to be fully sober and any any dom any dominant domin domin domine all of those domina the different terms okay. uh anyone worth their salt would say that you want to make sure the person has all of their faculties with them they are fully sober there is no impairment of judgment before you even begin to discuss the topic let alone start the topic Right. So, and that, I just wanted to draw that line again, that, you know, mm-hmm. consent, just because someone can talk and hold a conversation doesn't mean that they're able to give consent. If they're legally drunk, if they're really high, then, um, yeah, they're, they're impaired. 
Um, what they say you shouldn't listen to, wait till they sober up and then ask them again. It's not that hard a concept. Yeah. And um, excuse me, there's a there's a comic that came out recently that I know some people will freak out because I mentioned everyday feminism, but it was hosted over there and it's on a few other places that talks about a consent being a castle. Because we've heard discussions of it being tea and all this other stuff, but the castle one was interesting because it's constantly bringing up the topic of a dialogue. It's constantly bringing up, excuse me, it's constantly bringing up, okay, this is the room that we're wanting to work on right now. It's this topic, like uh, trying toys in bed during sex or something like that. And after you've sat there and you've worked on it, you've built the room up, you've built the foundations, you've put the wallpaper in, you don't have to ask as much because you already know how that other person feels, but you still have to be receptive if there are any changes like, oh, I want to change the, you use the toys on me now instead of I use it on you. And that goes back to, okay, you're changing something, we need to start the dialogue again. Versus this constant of it's each and every time you have to do it. Like with my husband, I'm going to use him because both of us are former doms. Uh, he and I have had so much communication back and forth over, we've been married almost six years now. Um, so much communication back and forth when it comes to what I am receptive to, what he is receptive to. Uh, he's able to notice if I have mood changes or uh, body language changes, things like that. So if we're, say, fooling around and all of a sudden one of my issues pops up, my dysphoria pops up or something, he is, we have had so many discussions and worked with each other for so long that he can see instantly, okay, I'm not comfortable and he will stop whatever is happening because he knows that if he continues, even if I don't speak up because of my dysphoria, I'm basically withdrawing consent, but I haven't been able to speak yet. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yes. Like I said, when you get to know somebody, mm -hmm. then consent becomes, um, yeah, you, you're reading the person and inter interpreting things, and that's when you feed back and you check in, right? Yeah, and when you're first getting to know somebody, like if I were to go back out in the scene and become a dom again, I would, if I'm just getting to meet the person, I'm not going to sit there and be able to read their body language until years down the line if I keep them as my sub. So I will constantly be verifying, like if there's a change in their tonal structure, if I'm like spanking them or something, and all of a sudden their voice changes or I notice that they move different. It's like, are you still okay with this? Is this still? And so I reaffirm consent constantly. And... It's even like, okay, well, I've used a bare hand to spank you. Are you all right if we try a leather paddle? Are you all right if we try this? And so there's that constant, constant dialogue, which seems to be missing, I would say, from a lot of discussions about consent. It's, it's as if it's just this rubber stamp of approval, and then you go. And if you have to reaffirm it or ask or create a dialogue back and forth, it's an inconvenience almost for people. I think there is, um, yeah, this, because they take it to the extreme, you know, and they mm -hmm. say you have to ask every three seconds, they make it into something, something ridiculous. So we're talking a little bit about your beliefs. I'm going to try to segue from like okay. your views on this and your beliefs and your morals when it comes to these issues on consent and respect for people and keeping a dialogue open to the if it's if it's okay with you to talk about your position on things in the world because you mentioned in our previous hangout you're not an atheist you're a skeptic and if you're to whatever degree you're comfortable talking about that what where do you where are you coming from what are your thoughts on things and how did you get there um 
one second. No problem. I can just edit this bit out. Yeah, my <laughs> my kids are. That's my okay. daughter came home from school early, so they're very and, faint in the background. By yeah, the way. I hear it really loud, so it's okay. But um, on the topic of basically my beliefs, I I was raised. I guess you could say I wasn't raised religious because um, pretty much my my first few memories of anything religious was my parents discussing finding a church uh, for the community aspect, not the religious aspect. And they because they were wanting to find a community to get into. And at the time where we lived, your your ways of getting into a community were either through the college because it was uh, UC Davis area or through a church. And so my my parents went and they investigated, oh, like constantly different. There's multiple dogs outside. Um, they very, like went through all these different churches looking to see what fit best and all that stuff. And we didn't we didn't go there for uh, Bible study. We didn't go there for uh, sermons every Sunday. It was we were there for like the holidays. We would show up, or we would go for we would usher so that we could talk with people. And one of the big things was that it was it was a church that promoted. Uh, LGBT awareness and acceptance. And this was back early 90s that this church was promoting it. So they were like one of the few. Cutting edge. Cutting yeah. edge, yeah. And so that was basically, yeah, I mean, we didn't go every week or anything. And my parents encouraged me to question. And even the church that I went to encouraged people to question no matter how embarrassing the question might sound. Are these some kind of Anglicans? Uh, Presbyterian. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, I know Episcopalians, but I don't know how Presbyterians relate to Episcopalians. It's uh, all very complicated on the Protestant side for me growing yeah. up Catholic. <laughs> it's basically, there's Protestant, and then there's all these little branches and Presbyterians, like, down at the very liberal end. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I just remember... The pastors, I we went to dinner and stuff like that. We I got to know their kids, all the sort of stuff. And they always encouraged me to question. It's like, do you have because I would come up and I'm like, hey, I'm reading this section of the Bible. Uh, I'm not really understanding this part. Or, hey, I just read in this was sixth grade. I was like, hey, I just read the Epic of Gilgamesh and it sounds a lot like the Noah's flood story. And I remember asking that to a church in the town I lived in, a different church, and practically having the door slammed in my face. But the the pastor or the minister that was the church that my parents and I went to, he said, well, as, uh, as you see, all religions stem basically from the same thing. We all receive this message, and it is how we tell the story that differs. And I was like, oh. When you're a kid, that's, yeah. Like, yeah. It sounds pretty good. It gets more complicated when you get older, but. Yeah, and that's actually what started my desire to study religion was I was noticing all these similarities because of my history classes. And I took a world literature in high school, and I'm like, holy holy crud, this is the same as this is the same as this is. So that was cool. Um, and the church kept suggesting, hey, question, if you're curious, here's these books that explain this. Here's the difference between these translations of the Bible. All sorts of stuff that they did. And I remember actually trying to go to another church because I'm a teenager at the time. I've got the hots for this one guy. And he is, I, if you could see an example of a Christian movie 
character in real life. He was like the living embodiment of that. I'm for Christ and we shall touch an arm and hug because that is the most you do. You do not do anything else because God would be upset type person. And side hug, side hug. Yeah. Side <laughs> hug. And hormones are raging. I was like, Hey, <laughs> I really want to get with this guy, but he's really religious. I'll go to his church. And the difference between his church, even though it was still supposedly a Presbyterian church, as they claimed, I found out it wasn't really. It was like this weird offshoot going back towards Baptist type thing. Um, And just the difference was night and day because they were more closed-minded they didn't accept questionings you went up to the front to get saved and my only knowledge of getting saved was every now and then you took communion if you wanted to reaffirm your uh your baptize your baptismal and you got baptized at one point that was all that I ever knew, I didn't know that you had to repeatedly go up there and like have somebody lay hands on you to cleanse you of your sins for the week or whatever. And so it was really weird. And looking back on it, it was pretty easy to get swept up in it because you do feel this almost energy when the they're doing high. That. Yeah, it's the emotional right. high. You're feeling this sense of togetherness, you feel something almost reaching out and touching you. And now that I've got over 15 years of experience it, under my belt and everything and psychology and all this other stuff, I'm going, oh, that's because of this and this and this and so on and so forth. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, it's like a, a little weekly emotional uplift. You go and you sing songs and you feel the spirit and you have this communal mm -hmm. thing. Uh, it's ritualized. Um, people observe other people doing it. They mimic the behaviors. And yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a natural high. Yeah. And it, it made me really want to study even more. So when I got out of high school and I started studying, my dad was really into uh, Eastern religions, Buddhism, things like that because of uh, his studies and his fascination with it. So I was pretty knowledgeable on that and I was knowledgeable on mythology and I was like, well, let's keep studying. And there was a place at the time called a uh, universal life church, which I'm sad to say now they're online and you can like buy your degree and stuff from them because they're not accredited anymore. And yes. yeah, that, that was fun when you realize that your master's degree is completely worthless. Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me. And I went there and they actually had a location in Modesto. And I started checking out books from them and I started going there and uh, getting stuff. And at first it was kind of more of a distance thing. And then when I moved back to California, I actually went physically. So that was about 2004 that I started actually physically going there. And they they covered all sorts of stuff about religion, about uh, the Christian religions, the Catholic versions, the various denominations of Christianity. They covered paganism. They covered uh, Wicca. They covered Zoroastrianism. Uh, they covered Buddhism, Sheikhism, all these different religions. And so I could study whatever I wanted and got a really well-rounded view. And I was also at the time coming to terms with my mental illnesses because I had, I had basically heard voices pretty much my whole life. And certain religious groups would tell me that that was the Holy Spirit or it was this one person reaching out to me, all these different stories that they told me over the years. And so I understood that there was a psychological aspect to it. And I was curious about the religious aspect. And I was also 
really skeptical about these claims of we are the one true religion. And so when I did my master's thesis, I actually wrote it on the plagiarism that Christianity did of other religions. And you can you can trace it back and forth throughout history of where they they kind of picked and ch picked and chose of different stuff and oh, then yeah, yeah certainly and then they ch like a like a high schooler trying to hide that they plagiarized they changed one little word or something like that and it it started after i finished my masters i was like well maybe i should go on to get my doctors or my chaplain degree and that's when i fully realize I can't do anything with this degree because no place will accept it because I'm not part of one of these uh uh mainline church, church. church yeah it was the uh the, the accreditation is only through certain church groups and since I wasn't through one of them I could never use my degree and so then I just started really looking at myself and my views and I had people telling me that since I didn't believe in God specifically that I was an atheist and I'm like well according to this an atheist is this 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 and this and I was like but I have this belief that we are all connected somehow either through <clears throat> through shared energy or I brought in like physics into it that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. So when we die, we become part of something else sort of thing. So is that to you entirely naturalistic? Um, I would say that it is pretty naturalistic. It's basically that I feel that there is this connection <coughs> between everybody and it's not the, Oh, the cosmic mother source or whatever type view. It's just this, when we die, we all go back into the whole, so to speak. But in terms of, let's say, consciousness, do you, like, is consciousness temporary with a material body? So you're, ta you're talking more like, um, again, I sorry to restate it, but just to be clear, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so like, a conscious mind is sort of an epiphenomenal thing that comes as a, about when the collection of a body and a mind and experience and like, acquisition of language and things. Um, but then, of course, that decays like everything because of entropy. Or is it a little bit more on the... Uh, like more of cosmic, you know, like above the material, or is it purely material and in terms of like human life and human consciousness in your, in, um, your view? in my view, just at, at this current point, cause I'm still constantly questioning Sure, is I think that it is on a cosmic scale, excuse me, that basically even after we're done, we continue on type sort of thing. And um, God, it was a, it was a horror author that I read that actually summed it up pretty nicely. Uh, Brian Lumley, who wrote the Necroscope series. And I'm not familiar with it, but a little shout out there to the, to that, yeah. to that series. It, it's hard to find these days. Um, but he basically described that when you die, all the, is gone is your physical form so the artists continue creating art but on a cosmic scale now so uh mathematicians continue creating bigger and better formulas and the restraints that they had while they were alive are gone now so you can continue doing what you were doing and it's it's almost like your chains are broken and removed from you and you are just free and if you are able to, and in my view, nobody's able to at this point, basically <clears throat> tap into that, uh, that consciousness stream of these people still continuing on now that they are long dead. If there's a way to tap into that, you could then start gaining knowledge from that. So... That's that's currently where I'm at. But as I said, I'm still constantly questioning it. It's like when we when we're born, 
we, how did I explain it to my, how did I explain it to her? When we're born, we are basically like this little flash drive of a body. We go down or whatever term you want to use, you're born and you start collecting data and experiences. And when you die, your body goes away, but all of that collected data and experience remains and becomes part of whatever is out there, the ether. And I think part of the reason I think of it that way is one, it's a way to deal with my mental illness and hearing voices is I'm hearing uh, for lack of a better phrase, it's like I'm hearing somebody that's two steps over and three steps up. That's actually the height level that I hear at. Okay. So it's it's almost like um, you could say the parallel universe or the multiverse theory. And it's almost like I'm hearing them type thing. Like they cross my path and I'll hear something and then it goes away. And so because of that experience and because of basically everything that I've read over the years, that's, I guess you'd say my way of coping with everything. Yeah. I didn't, I wanted to ask this before, but I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought, but if it's okay to talk about the voices that you hear, I was curious as to what, so you've talked about the location of, of the sound and that's mm -hmm. really interesting because it's never something that would have occurred to me to consider as an experience. You know, because if you don't have the experience of hearing voices, then when someone hears it, it's just kind of like a concept. And what what my projection or my understanding of it was would be like with the sound of my own voice in my head when I talk to myself, you know, just the sort of running thoughts. And so I was curious as to what your experience of that was like and how it's different from your everyday thoughts. Um. Well, there's there's self-talk which is what you just mentioned which mine sadly is not nice <laughs> my self-talk is very uh detrimental and negative sadly because of various things but then there's the voices and the differentiation between self-talk and voices is the self-talk you can tell to shut up and if you focus on it and tell it hey shut up stop it generally stops the voices you have literally no control over. So they will continue talking. They will continue doing something, excuse me, no matter what you do. And, uh, for me, as there's, there's like three or four that I can hear that are the, the two steps over three up type thing that, are very distinct voices that I hear on a constant basis. And in fact, I named my channel originally after one of them, uh, the McKenna persona that I used to have. And, but in general, it sounds for people who are trying to figure out what it sounds like, at least for me is if you've ever stood in the middle of like a crowded concert hall or a crowded auditorium of some sort, that's basically what it sounds like is there's just talking and voices all around you. And for me, I can't really differentiate when it's that level of voices because it's just this chatter that's nonstop. I mean, even now I'm, I actually have to take medications just to tone it down enough to focus. But even now I can still hear the chatter going on. Right. And it, it can get very distracting at times, especially when something gets close enough that you think you're hearing somebody talking. And so you want to focus and go, what is this person saying? What are they doing type thing? Right. Like you're sitting listening. There's a conversation next to you. You mm -hmm. kind of can't help but be drawn into it or kind of strain when you hear things that you recognize as a sentence structure. Mm -hmm. And the weird part is, is for me that the stuff that I pick up isn't always in English which of course adds more to the thought of, well, maybe I'm picking up on another universe or something like that. Um, and it's like, wait, am I, 
and I'll, I'll jokingly say, am I receiving signals from the mothership or something? Because it's not in English, and I don't really speak any other language. I've heard other languages throughout my life, but I don't speak or understand them very well. The closest I have is Spanish. But it's like a completely different language or dialect that I've never heard of, and it, but it's not gibberish because there's, there's structure. Right. And yeah, that's something that you've had. Is that you have you lived with that as long as you can remember? Yeah. Um, my parents used to say that it was just my imaginary friends and my therapist. I, I've been in therapy since I was six, basically, um, because I was abnormal. And uh, they always told me it was my imaginary friends. And sometimes yeah it was imaginary friends i mean obviously robin hood and maid marion from disney are obviously going to be your imaginary friends versions but then there's the ones that aren't and learning to differentiate between them right but i'd say as i got older the chatter's grown louder is the only problem right that's interesting i mean i mean it's it's uh, it sucks for you because it's really distracting but um, for me, I would I would be. Have you ever had like a um, um, N M M letters MRI or any kind of neurological scans when they were initially diagnosing you, or has it always been sort of you know through a doctor's office and a prescription pad? Again, if this is too personal, oh, always it's, it's, okay. It's fine. I just wanted to let my cat out real quick because he's glaring at me and calling <laughs> you know that over. look. You yeah. know that look. So I'll be right back while I do that. Yeah, no worries. Uh Actually, I've had, I'm trying to like tally up how many things I've had. Um, I've had MRIs done. I've had EEGs done. I've had CAT scans, all sorts of stuff done. Uh, sleep studies. Um, I remember the one that I had, there was an EEG that I had done back when I was eight. Because I had a... Uh, they they think it was a grand mal seizure or a, a massive night terror of something to that effect. We've never figured out what it was. I distinctly remember being fully conscious, but being unable to control my body. That would be my, terrifying. My parents insist that I was asleep. And the way that I remember it was I was in my body, but I wasn't. If that kind of makes sense, it was like, I start out in my body and then I just kind of move to the side and I watch as I'm thrashing and panicking and everything. And this was during the time of the lovely HMOs. So by the time you get to the ER, everything's fine again, so to speak. And the episode um, had completed. Yeah. It was over. Um, it looked, according to my parents, that I had had a stroke on my entire right side. Like everything was dead and pale on my right side. And so they did all these different tests. And of course, whichever specialist we went to, they diagnosed me with whatever they specialized in. So when, every, when you're a hammer, mm -hmm. every problem looks like a nail, right? Yeah. And so I got diagnosed after the, they did the EEG and my brain looked like it was having a constant seizure, even when I was asleep. And so they were like, oh, they have epilepsy, medication. And turned out I didn't have epilepsy, but <laughs> um, that's also around the start of my body dysmorphia issues of my weight and everything. Because you give somebody who doesn't have epilepsy something like Tegretol, and right. they're going to gain massive amounts of weight. Um, But... It was that my brain readings have been abnormal. Like every time I get them done, the the person reading the scans or reading the tests goes, we don't know how to explain this aside from abnormal. And I'm sitting there going, that's not helpful. Right. <laughs> right. Is there an implant in my brain? Is there a tumor? Well, there was a tumor for a while, but that was a... Uh, I think it, it was either a pituitary or a pineal tumor. It was one of those that it just shrunk on its own. So it left. Oof. But yeah. 
Yeah. You have you been through so much? <laughs> yeah. That's why people ask me, how are you feeling? Tired. <laughs> yeah, I can get, yeah, I understand that. I can see that where that would come from. But yeah, all the all the tests I've had, I've had various uh from the neurological, the neurobiological, the neuromicrobiological, uh, the MD side, I've had the naturopath, I've tried acupuncture, you name it, I've tried it. <laughs> right. And um, in fact, I'm getting ready to go back in next week to start services because our health insurance just threw a monkey wrench in everybody who had Medicaid. Uh, they switched us to a new managed care for mental health. And so I get to restart and retell everything next week. <laughs> oh, no. yeah, the, your your experiences are, are really fascinating. And I know that they've been really difficult for you. So I don't want to make them sound clinical and, you know, detached from the suffering that you've experienced. But your your experience of of the world as a consequence of the way that your brain is organized and i don't really like the term abnormal i think it was the mm -hmm. most recent season of elementary where sherlock kind of has a love interest for a few episodes and they talk about her being on the spectrum and she said you know i like i prefer to think of myself as um neuro atypical yeah and or think, neurodiverse is the term that i've yeah. heard and I really like that term immediately. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I really like the term because it's it's actually a lot more accurate in in terms of what what it, what what is it happening, which is that there's variation in the way that our brains are organized because of the differences in our our genetic makeup mm -hmm. and how those are expressed. And it makes a lot of sense to me that your construction of your understanding of the world would obviously reflect your experiences of the world and because my experiences have been extremely different i've i have a different construction of my understanding of the world and that's why at the end of the day you know i i, I don't really i have lots of people in my life of, of faith i have friends who are muslims and people who are lapsed catholics and people who are practicing various things um if you ask me i'll give you my opinion why i think theism in particular is quite harmful the way that it's been practiced in a lot of cultures across human history but you know i'm 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 not here to make a decision on your decisions about your experiences but i'm i'm very fascinated by them be, because they are so different from my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's it's actually one of the things for me is that because of because I know that part of my beliefs are due to a mental illness, <clears throat> it, it actually makes me constantly review them. It makes me be skeptical of my own views. And to constantly reevaluate and look at things again over and over and go oh well here's new information could this explain x about my views and there's actually god i think it was i think it was the skeptic feminist one of the three masterminds behind that uh who when i was describing my views to them said that it was very similar to uh, the there's a game called Mass Effect, and there's a race. I believe they are the Asari. I'm like trying to Google it while I'm thinking of it. Um, and basically, their view of everybody basically is connected. When you die, you all go back up into this this hole, and you're constantly basically connected no matter where you are type feeling. Right. And I was like, oh, great. A video game has similar views to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have uh, in the course of my life and in youthful times had uh, experiences with that. I've been, let's just call them mind altering. And, and I think the, the experience of that to me showed the variation in, in how people's brains can function. Because if, if you have, you know, because, you know, you're on pain medication or whatever else, been in an altered state, you would 
know that it, it is, you know, it's altered because the way that you're experiencing it is so vastly different. And that vast difference is a process of the way that your brain is, is organizing that information or transmitting it to you or the way that you're experiencing that trans transmission. So like, for me, because I, well, I can talk about this a little bit later, like, or, or just after this about why I, I can't cross back into a, a oneness. But I can um, also understand that the, you know, having, a, having those experiences and making sense of them and putting them together in a way that um, helps you understand the world and relate to other people. Having, I think, a different experience than your regular one makes you question things more. Mm -hmm. Because you're, if you've had that altered experience, then you know to some degree, well, what I was perceiving before wasn't t capital T truth, you know. So, yeah, I think that the um, there's a lot of work left to be done on the frontier of brain science and the way that our brains can, um, you know, be you know, manipulated or whatever else. I, what I'm thinking of in particular is a, a study I read about recently where they gave mushrooms to people with terminal illness because the people facing death had a high level of anxiety, understandably. And they gave them the mushrooms. And that experience provides a lot of people with that oneness that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. And having gone through the the trip, you know, uh, they described some of the negative experiences, but then they all had really positive experiences and they came out the other end no longer fearing death or having their anxiety about it really reduced because they felt that oneness. There was also the woman who gave the TED Talk who had a mind-altering experience because she had a stroke and she lost the part of the brain that does like the high functioning reasoning. You know, she was trying to dial 911. She would dial the nine and go to the one and then forget what number she had just dialed and things, but her emotions were still all there. And that sense of oneness with the universe was very powerful for her. And she managed to recover from her stroke and she went on to give these TED talks. And part of it was, you know, you have this capacity in your own brain to feel this oneness. It's built into us. We have this innate uh, potentiality there to be realized. And if you look at the minds of meditating Buddhist monks or Christian nuns, when they felt one with God, that was the same brain experiences or one with the universe from the Buddhist side, because, you know, there are divine sort of gods to, to go hang out with in, in Buddhism. But their brains were functioning in the same way. They were just interpreting the, 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 the importance or the significance of that experience differently. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think the brain is just a, an incredibly fascinating thing. Yeah, because one of the, I, mean, I know that a lot of atheists like to, <clears throat> and skeptics, like to make fun of the, uh, the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? And strangely enough, a lot of what's discussed in it, for people who are wanting to try and understand how I work, or at least my brain works, what the bleep do we know discusses it a lot better than I could. Um, just like everything is possibilities and probabilities and they all exist. And it's just when we make that one choice, basically, is when the other possibilities, they don't so much disappear, but they no longer affect us. And so it's like constant branching decisions sort of thought. So if anybody's wanting to figure out how I think, go watch that. <laughs> yeah. I am as stubborn as we can lock our horns together and